sweet. Hello, welcome. If you're filing in. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rail 651st New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Ronnie Quevedo and Jason Rosenfeld. We are thrilled to welcome poet Amish Trivedi here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Deeply engaged with notions of identity and the intersection of mainstream and historically marginalized cultures, Ronnie Quevedo re envisions pre and post colonial iconographies, offering nuanced examinations of personal and social histories. The recuperation of indigenous languages of abstraction, the revalorization of their associated labor, and the centering of a living connection between contemporary and centuries old cultural markers remain key to Quevedo's ongoing practice. Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College, Jason Rosenfeld has curated exhi the exhibitions John Everett Millay, Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, and River Crossings. He is the co-author of the monograph Cecily Brown and a senior, senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you all so much for joining us. I will turn it over to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Great to be here again. Welcome, Ronnie. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Jason. Where are you, where are you coming to, from? Uh, where are you? From the Bronx. Mm, In the Southwest. Bronx. Sweet. I'm coming yeah. to you live. Yeah, that made Raven happy. I'm coming to you live from uh, the West Village. Uh, it's great to cool. have everybody here and as people that roll in. Um, thank you to Carolyn uh, for hosting today and to uh, Chloe, of course, for overseeing everything. And Aaron at um, Alexander Gray and Dane and everybody else at the gallery who has helped out today uh, to make this possible. This is our 651st new social environment. And I would be remiss and GE would get mad at me if I didn't mention where we are in the home run uh, list. We are approaching Willie Mays, 660 <laughs> home runs. We will be there on Monday, October 3rd. We will time with Willie Mays and then A-Rod talk about the Bronx. A-Rod is coming up at 696. Anyway, it's a, it's a uh, tribute to everybody who works so hard at the rail and Fong to have the vision to make these things happen. I'm deeply appreciative every time that I get to do this and to meet great artists like Ronnie, as you will, as you will see. So Ronnie Quevedo, um, let me start the imagery and everybody see that? It's full screen, yeah? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, Ronnie um, coming to us live from the Bronx. Uh, he's going to talk about his uh, career, his schooling, and uh, his work. Um, we're going to discuss a little soccer today, football, soccer. I know he's very excited for La Tri to kick off yeah. the <laughs> World Cup on November 20th uh, against the host nation, the host nation Qatar, uh, 11 a.m. And then their second match is. Uh, against the Netherlands, same as the USA-England match on uh, Black Friday, November, November 25th. So it's going to be a great end of the year. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about the, his connections with football and other elements in the world. Um, the reason, one reason why we're having this talk is because right now uh, on West 26th Street, you can go see uh, the wonderful exhibition, uh, um, Entre, Entre Aqui Aya, um, it's uh, at Alexander Gray and Associates, Alexander Gray Associates Gallery, um, and we're going to talk about the work towards the end today. There's just a couple installation views. This is the upper floor in the gallery, and um, here is the entry um, in the gallery here as you, to go upstairs and a couple works there, which we will be uh, discussing. And that's the, that's the main floor. 
We're going to talk about this cool work in the middle. Think soccer and other things. So, Ronnie, we're yeah. going to sit on this for a little bit. This is uh, called the History of Rules and Measures, number one, from 2012, mm -hmm. which you completed the year that you finished your uh, studies at the uh, little school in New Haven called Yale, the Yale School of Art, um, where so many great artists have come out of. And maybe talk to us just a little bit, give everybody a background about your uh, your life, born in Ecuador in 1981, and your transit to the United States, and then your uh, education at Cooper and Yale. Let's start there. Yeah, um, I was born in Ecuador, uh, grew up in the Bronx, grew up in the Bronx in the 80s, and went to school in the city, um, then went to undergrad at Cooper Union, and started in 99. I took uh, several years off to figure out um, how to keep myself sustained <laughs> and then ended up going to grad school when I was about 30. Um, I'd always been working on my studio practice throughout. I, I don't think it's anything that I ever considered secondary. I very much considered it in line with a lot of the uh, design work that I was doing as a graphic designer. So there's a also a big in, um, kind of intersection of graphic design and this notion of sports iconography, heraldry, uh, courts, and diagrammatic drawings. That has always been really interesting to me. Um, a big part of it has always been the connection with my dad, who was a soccer player in Ecuador. And so he was a professional soccer player for many years in Ecuador. And when we came to the States, um, he was a bit older. Uh, he started working um, um, at a, as a, um, he started working at factories, but also maintained a lot of his connections with the uh, soccer community here in, in, the, in New York. And through that, he played indoor soccer. He also refereed indoor soccer. And then he refereed a lot of the, the amateur leagues that you see throughout all of New York City. So my connection with my dad and also sports, there's this very much one about community and kind of understanding that sports was this kind of uh, space for convening. So it was almost like a, like a ritual, like every Saturday or Sunday we'd go out, I would kind of shadow him and get to know the city through the parks and different fields that we would go to. And indoor soccer leagues was a big part of it. Um, I actually just came from visiting my uncle who had, his, had started one of the soccer leagues. Um, and so basically we would, this was really interesting to me because I was like, I was like, what, nine when I started being able to go with my dad. And so like all of a sudden elementary schools, junior high schools, high schools would be rented out and they would turn into these small indoor soccer tournaments. So the field of the, the, the basketball court became a soccer field, which to me was really fascinating. So it was a lot of games of five on five. And the other part of it was like, I, I got to see my dad kind of in action as this uh, referee. And so that part of it was really interesting to me, has always been a big um, uh, interest. But, and then as I kind of got older, um, started thinking about it, what it meant to kind of um, build a space that was kind of not intended for this use, you know? So this kind of multi-use system and multifunctional aspect of things uh, was a big um, interest of mine. There's a lot of kind of also connections with a lot of the the um, the music and the culture that I was growing up in the Bronx. You know, like I there wasn't a big Ecuadorian community. You know, there was you know in the Bronx there was uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Black communities. A lot of kind of uh, connections to hip hop, and so this kind of like. Um, discussion about space as multifunctional, multi-use um, with informed by so many different perspectives was always a foundation for me. So like everything always seemed kind of in negotiation. And so, so that idea of kind of uh, making do with whatever you're presented and um, you know, carving out a space for your own activities or culture or whatever you want to talk about it. You know, I, I think, that people will see as we look at the art, the idea that, you know, the gyms that you're talking about were not, as you say, made for indoor soccer. That was something yeah. that was invented by people who were not, who, who came from abroad, immigrants, and who were bringing yeah. in the game and yeah. playing. And then, 
And, um, you know, the, some of the companies like Adidas got into it and was making indoor soccer shoes, which then became popular. But the mm -hmm. idea of having to go into a gym, put down your own, own uh, tape to make a court, to make a, a pitch, really, and bring your own goals is really interesting. And as people will see, it sort of becomes a kind of uh, symbol of other elements of cultural uh, assimilation or uh, carving out a space um, yeah. in your work. But how did you get interested in art initially? I think um, initially, uh, I didn't want to do yeah. uh, book reports when I was in second grade. And so yeah. I uh, found a way to kind of show my teachers that I was really good at drawing. I was like, I read the book. Can I actually just come up with a way to show you that I read the book by creating a poster for it? So I think maybe even from early on, I was finding ways to, to maneuver into spaces that I felt comfortable in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always drawing. I was always making my own toys. Um, sketching on the subway was always a huge fascination for me. That was one way that I just kind of... Um, you occupied my time and I You're think taking the Lexington Avenue line down to Cooper <laughs> or were you <laughs> yeah or did you yeah did you all the did way you live at home when you were going to Cooper yeah all the way I, yeah. I lived okay. at home for my whole four years it was an hour train ride each way um getting home late a lot um at different times for different projects taking projects yeah. on the train you know uh very much a New York kind of approach to going to art school now at Cooper, were you exposed to kinds of art making that uh, you know opened up ideas for you? I and mean, it, it sounds like you were making works when you were younger that was kind of made out of materials at hand um, mm -hmm. for school projects, et cetera. Did you find yeah. that that was something that you were looking to do at Cooper or were you looking to get a more traditional kind of base? I think at Cooper, I was trying to hone in on my skills. You know, I ended up going to a magnet school, LaGuardia High School, which is art okay. school. And so yeah. like I was introduced to a lot of these um, art histories or the, even the notion of art history in, in high school. Um, and so I was always really invested in like understanding the, the kind of lineage of a lot of these traditions, right? So drawing was always a big part of my, um, of like my own identity just because it was so simple. All you needed was a piece of paper and some pencil. So. Yeah. The, material, the materiality of it was really good because it was accessible, you know, just like a lot of the games. So, yeah. um, but at Cooper, I was introduced to um, some, some new notions of how to make art, the, uh, I guess maybe even a more contemporary or more modern presentation of art history, starting understanding, uh, you know, anything from the 1900s up to now thinking about minimalism, you know, I think um, there was a big emphasis on on the Bauhaus informing the curriculum yeah. at Cooper. And so even the Bauhaus, uh, you know, that was a, a big um, kind of turning point for me to see how that can influence kind of a whole curriculum, even a whole school and even the visual language that one can produce. So craft was a big part that. of it. Yeah. It's interesting that that sort of uh, uh, expansive but still rigorous education that they were pursuing at the Bauhaus between the world wars in Germany was something mm -hmm. that was being promulgated in Cooper in the early 2000s. I, I find that interesting. What uh, teachers sort of had an impact on you there? At Cooper, I really had a range of uh, of teachers from I mean, what was amazing that there was no major, right? So like I can kind of yeah. dip my toes in everything. You know, I've studied right. with um, designers from France, Philippe Appelois. I worked with um, um, David Story. I worked with Dave Gleason, uh, Christine Ozinski. Um, people that were there that were really kind of, um, kind of uh, introductions to a lot of disciplines, I think. It, it was yeah. for me just trying to get as much as I possibly could at the time. Yeah. Right. So what, let me ask you, before you went to Yale then, yeah. which was about maybe eight years, what was the most mm -hmm. interesting thing that you did in your interim Bef period? Before I went to Yale? Oh man. Yeah. Um, between Cooper and I think Yale, my, was the my time at the, job you had? I think my time at the Studio Museum in Harlem was um, okay. crucial 
I think it was yeah. just as foundational as like some of the stuff I did at Cooper. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just the the history of the of the museum, the the mission of the museum, understanding that um, artists were the ones that founded a, a, a lot of what still yeah. occurs to this day. You know, and just seeing that a lot of this was kind of um, communal driven in a way. So that was really empowering and really getting a sense of a history that Cooper didn't really provide, like uh, an art history that Cooper really didn't provide at the time. I think things are different kind now. Because, alternative history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or a, or a parallel, but alternative history. So what, were, what yeah. was your job at the Studio Museum? I was an educator. So I okay. worked with the photography program there called Expanding the Walls. And I was All there right. for about two and a half years, but I was an intern for a, a full year um, mm -hmm. before I got that job. Yeah. Wow. So you were working with kids, school kids, you're working with- uh, Teenagers. People of all ages, yeah. teenagers. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, everyone's waiting to see what it looks like, the new one, when it's finished. I think it's next year. The, I the think it might be next be year, yeah. 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 The skeleton golden. Thelma Golden, Friend of the Rail, is a, is a powerhouse, and that it's an amazing institution. So that's really interesting. Really so then you, then you went up to Yale, and what did yeah. you find when you got there? What, was your, what did you feel like was your aim or your goal to get out of two years at Yale? I got to say, I was really fortunate to be friends and peers with people that have already gone to the program. And so a lot of them had really um, um, influenced me to look at the art school and also beyond it, and just trying to make mm -hmm. connections with the resources at school. So trying not to stay so kind of tunnel vision about art yep. school or like the school of art and realizing that there's so many more resources surrounding the school. And that was actually a huge kind of uh, blessing in a way to, to get that feedback from people who had been there through before. Um, I talked mm -hmm. to Willem Cordova, I talked to Leslie Hewitt um, and other, artists that had gone through the program before to get a sense of what that space might be like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who, what professors had a kind of impact on you there? I gotta say everybody that I really, um, there, there's a lot of people. I mean, William, mm -hmm. William Villalongo was a, a really great person to have there um, who I had known b before I got to grad school. Byron Kim was there. Um, mm -hmm. Why am I blanking out? Um, I've had really mm -hmm. great visits with uh, Sarah Oppenheimer, uh, Huma mm -hmm. Baba, uh, Sam Messer yeah. was a really great um, influence of material, working through yeah. a lot of ideas. And drawing um, too, of course. Yeah, and drawing. Sam. The connection to drawing with yeah. Sam was really, um, it, it was nice, you know, it's just like, okay, there's some basic things that still connect a lot of people on how to make these things, how to make yeah. objects, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I did a talk long ago now, one of these early NSEs with um, Njedeka Akunili Crosby. Yeah. First came out of Yale also. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the two is kind of related. You cross paths, right? I mean, she she spoke at length about her experience at Yale, but the, the material that you both work with is not dissimilar. And working with, you know, sort of papers and, mm -hmm. and collaging on, on surfaces, which is you know, not the typical Yale, you come out making paint, oil paintings, um, yeah. sort of uh, curriculum. So looking at a work like this, maybe talk a little bit about what you were doing in your, you know, early, early days coming out of Yale here, the History of Rules and Measures, number one, 2012. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think I was um, always trying to, I don't know if it was intentional, it was probably intentional, kind of being counter to a lot of the stuff that was, um, um, going on, you know, I, I was always thinking about alternative processes and alternative mm -hmm. materials. And when I got into the gymnasium Florence, kind of towards the last part of my time, um, the last few months of my time at Yale, uh, that I started thinking about um, my dad and the history of soccer and the role of abstraction in my work. I had a really amazing studio visit uh, with Hilton Owls who um, was kind of led to my studio by Elizabeth Alexander, who I'd taken a class with, um, who kind of presented this, um, this uh, practice or this uh, kind of experimental place of 
positioning myself as my dad and his experiences, putting myself in his position of someone who was 30 years old, uh, about to start a family, but also very much involved in soccer, um, only speaking Spanish. And so there was this experiment that I did, a series of drawings of like what, what it would mean to be him. Um, he passed away in 2008. So it had been already six years uh, since his passing, four years, I guess. Um, and so I was really invested in what it meant to kind of think about myself through someone else. And so through that process, I started thinking about the spaces he had interacted with, which had also been the spaces that I kind of um, had witnessed through him. And so one of the first things that came to mind was the field and thinking about the gymnasium floors that we had spent time with. Um, so this piece, History Rules and Measures, is kind of thinking about indoor soccer league in particular and what it means to remap specific places. So what this piece that you see is um, a remapping of just one diagram of basketball. And so as I was placing each one down, thinking about this um, space that is identifiable, but yet being restructured to represent something else. Um, mm -hmm. My personal kind of my own interest in architecture was also um, really nice to see it come out in, in these works because I think there was something about this um, attempt to being exact or to being able to measure things was coming to the surface a lot. And so mm -hmm. this was starting to be, um, this work was right at the tail end of grad school and right as I was, as I was starting um, a residency in Houston, uh, the core program. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the core program, which is, I mean, given rise, a lot of great artists have come through that. Um, and and had you spent any time in that part of the country before? No, I, it was yeah. my first time in Houston. Had a huge yeah. culture shock, just like I did at Cooper and at Yale. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea was to get away from New York. I, I, I realized how beneficial it was to kind of be um, away from New York and being able to focus on work. And so stepping away from it, um, it was nice to um, have more physical space and more mental capacity just focus on stuff yeah yeah it's interesting another person that i've done this doing with is shazia sikander also did that program mm. and yeah. also was going there you know like you she was coming from RISD, um having no knowledge at all about the region or what she would find there if there was a pakistani presence at all and mm -hmm. and found it to be an incredibly open and welcoming place with a great yeah. studio program and a real connection to the community such that she's done public art projects there now uh, mm -hmm. more recently yeah so so it's also a sports saturated community <laughs> it, it, you know texas <laughs> is, is sportsville right so i I, yeah. I i wonder if that sort of had some kind of impact on on um uh, you know sort of convincing you to, to go with this to go with this idea i think i think the the amount of space available and the pace of everything allowed me to like actually tune some stuff out i mean i was always interested in sports i was always watching uh, football on Sundays, it was like, it's so much easier to be in Houston sometimes to watch sports because that's all people do on Sunday. Um, yeah. And I think the scale of the work, um, it got bigger. Um, it just allowed some experimentation that I don't know that I would have gotten if I had got, came straight back to, to New York. So right. I started thinking about things differently. Um, and I guess in a way, the emphasis in a lot of the work at least the, the public work in, in, in Houston, um, you know, there's a big James Terrell piece at Rice University. Yeah. There's the Manil collection with a huge kind of um, presence of work that just occupies space. And it's not ne necessarily maximalist, right? It's just like yeah. one, you know, how many paintings are in the Rothko Chapel? Maybe 10, you know, but there's like a whole yeah. building dedicated to a kind of meditative site. And so those kinds of influences were really, um, I think they were pretty impactful looking back at it now. Yeah. Interesting. All right, so I'm gonna go to the next thing, but I just wanna point yeah. out a few elements here uh, for people to look at and think about going forward. Uh, Ronnie's using a kind of fringe here, which looks to me a little like textile fringe, but is also mm -hmm. of course the slats, the idea of slats of wood 
for the court. Yeah. So keep that in mind. We're going to be talking about these in a little bit. Yeah. But talking about the Rothko Chapel. So come back <laughs> in, in, in New York, in the Queens Museum. There's this wonderful installation, uh, No Hay Medio Tiempo. There's no halftime in 2017, yeah. mm -hmm. where you take over an entire, the main you know open room space in the museum, which is just on the other side of the panorama. Um, so talk a little bit about this piece here and then uh, the, the floor piece that you, everybody sees. Yeah, this was actually a really nice moment. I got to say on a personal level and artistic level, it was my first museum show um, in New York um, that Hitomi Iwasaki had invited me to be a part of. And it was um, going back to Flushing Meadow Park where I used to yeah. go to with my dad every week to watch him referee. So um, I kind of, it, it was one of those moments where I know exactly what I wanted to do. And I presented this idea to take over the, the sunken floor or sunken living room as they, can, yeah. as they call it in, in the museum. And it was almost a perfect, it, it's almost the exact size of a basketball floor. And so the wooden floor was there. And I was like, I really want to manifest these drawings that I've been sketching out in a way. Like all those mm -hmm. pieces, the one that, from before were in a way schematics for these large scale interventions. And mm -hmm. I finally got the opportunity. Um, and in a way, the kind of, um, encouragement from a museum to like, yeah, take on the whole space. And so the first um, iteration of these kind of massive installations uh, with vinyl and the diagrammatic floors and abstraction was here at the Queens Museum. And it was at full scale. So what you see is are, are pieces of vinyl uh, cut at different lengths, um, mat, uh, sketched, to the exact size of the slats in the floor. So it's like mm -hmm. a very kind of nitpicky way of like making a drawing, you know? It's like, I need to know the surface before I, I can start working on it. Um, there was this other um, piece on top of it, uh, another component where there was this um, soccer ball, you can kind of see it here, made out of cement right that was covered in field chalk. And so that field chalk, you know, I would go in every two or three weeks. It was never like a public performance. I would just go in and make a drawing, an abstract drawing. And people would, the the interest was this kind of inversion of participation. So in order to participate with the work, you actually had to erase and disperse the drawing. And so this kind of inversion was really interesting to me where your participation is actually um, erasing a mark that was there by the artist. And then the, so the, the, flat, the yeah, but the ball yeah. was fixed. The ball is fixed, or no? Yeah, it moves around. It's not intended to move around. Like the idea was that it would stay there, but you <laughs> yeah, know, people would people kick it and it find around. out that it's made out of cement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, you hurt your foot. But yeah, it, you can see the dispersion of, of chalk there on the surface. It's really interesting. Of course, chalk. You know, players put it on their hands. Basketball players. Yeah. Um, LeBron lets it go up into the yeah. air yeah. before every game. That sort of yeah. idea. Um, and just to give people an idea of what you're looking at here, you know, this relates to high school gyms, wherever. This is the my high school gym, Pennsbury High School, home of the Falcons, Ferris, uh, Ferris Hills, Pennsylvania. You see these kind of markings that Ronnie's talking about on the mm -hmm. court, but also really interesting, like here you see the basketball markings for uh, the game, but then this is the volleyball marking, which doesn't go away. It stays on there. So that idea of these sort of layering of different um, fields of, of play and different um, orientations, which are part of this part and parcel of this kind of artificial map on, on the floor, which is what you're sort of playing with here. Here's an amazing view as if from the jumbotron above the Queens Museum Bar, <laughs> if there was one, looking down at the, uh, at the uh, work. And you can see here the staircase that allows you access to the sunken living room um, yeah. and uh, the vinyl and the other materials and uh, and the where's the ball? I don't see it. Someone moved it. Maybe they no. We had to ball. remove it for this for this image. Oh, for the photo. Okay. Yeah, we had chalk. to move it out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's 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 fantastic. It just it, it communicates something about motion and movement, but also in the chat, G Schwartz is saying about how the markings are like musical notations. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's re recalling how Miles Davis called Trin Quincy Troop 
told Quincy Troop how he could he really liked court play because he could hear yeah. the sneakers, the, the squeaks of sneakers, which you know you only get in an empty gym or if you're lucky enough to be like sitting really close to the court, yeah. but you hear that kind of that kind of cadence and, and it's mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing. It makes everybody think of afternoons in the gym. Yeah, that part of it was so I mean, whenever I make these pieces. You know, it's always like thinking about taking one, what it would be like to have a plank and just move it from one piece to another, right? And that's mm -hmm. the way that I kind of construct these pieces, just like plank by plank. And so it's like really about puzzles, like yeah, those puzzles yeah. that you move around, and you have to find the right, the right image. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this nice build up to something that, you know, uh, like it's very much in line with the role of play, right? Like the movement of these players, like how would you track it? How could you track it? And so... Mm -hmm. This connection to that as like a pathfinding is also this connection to mapping spaces of migrant communities from one place to another. Um, mm -hmm. And then still kind of thinking about, um, in a way, initially, there were very much mappings of like um, my own history, my, my parents' history of moving from one place to another, this connection to like everything being negotiable. You know, because like mm -hmm. so many times when you see these games, obviously things are marketed and this notion of boundaries comes up, but how malleable so many of them are. Like these notion of right. rules being political and what they're meant to do, you know. And then if I, I go into the, like the history of what these rules are intended to do, like, you know, like the idea of like the NBA banning dunks, um, right. you know, when I think it was either... Will Chamberlain or Bill? I think it was Will Chamberlain. Um, well, the college in college they banned dunks because of uh, yeah Chamberlain, and you were not you were not allowed. So players who were athletic enough to get above the rim, they just drop the ball through instead of dunking yeah. it. Yeah, and all <laughs> these things that come up with like even the dress codes that were implemented in the '90s by by right. David Stern, yeah. like what it what the what those things mean. Right, like right. There's a lot of history of like keeping people from expressing oneself. And so, um, like we're not letting the, not letting LeBron James wear a black mask when he broke his yeah. orbital, and yeah. saying no, it has to be a clear gla glass. Was such a kind of racist marker there of, of the NBA's you know, conservatism. Yeah, and there's a lot of control too. It was like NCAA not allowing high school students. Uh, I'm sorry, the NBA not allowing high school students to enter the draft anymore. All these like systems yeah. of control based on like people having access to their own agency like it yeah. seems really subtle but it's pretty blatant like it's just a matter of control and so yeah. um th there there's a there's a tone to that uh, i'm sorry like a connection to those things and, and the work mm -hmm. as well i see also there's a kind of color use which is i don't know if you, you assess it or give it any symbolic value uh, but i made a little joke before about ecuador and latri but of course the colors about ecuador <laughs> is our red, blue, and yellow. And then yeah. you have, it seems like black and white, which are more the, more controlling sort of elements um, in, in culture or, or on these, these sort of courts. So it feels like there are a lot of things that go into this. And also I look at this and I see abstract marks and swirling forms and mm -hmm. you know, a sense of, a sense of uh, chaos, uh, which is so similar to a, a kind of mark making that is very far removed from what you're doing, but that is related to a kind of abstract tradition um in painting yeah i think um let's look, no go ahead let's look at uh some smaller work before we get into the exhibition um this is from a series um that you did in 2018 uh yeah. your pronunciation will be much better than mine um <laughs> uh, and uh this is where you start to work with um wax and pattern paper and gold leaf on muslin. Mm -hmm. So maybe explain the materials here a little bit because they will factor into a lot yeah. of the other work. And also quite clearly here, this is the image of a soccer pitch. And then yeah. with these wonderful lines, which connote movement and some have little arrows, but also a sense of, they also look like Mercator maps of the globe. So that yeah. idea of geographical That's shifting right. is inherent here. Yeah. And um, on the top is uh, kind of a breakdown of the measuring system for a globe. So it goes from zero to 90 and then ah, back okay. to 90. Um, so yeah, I think in around this time, I one thing that kind of shifted for me is kind of 
thinking about my parents' history as a model for making work. I think I started stepping into a space where I'm like, the narratives I'm trying to convey um, may not be available or did not, or don't have as much presence in the kind of more popular art canon. Right. And so I just wanted to make it a really, and for me, a much more explicit connection to the mm -hmm. materials, the history, the labor of my parents and the people that they represent and the communities that we represent. And so mm -hmm. um, from even from the work in 2012, I was committed to making work out of the materials that are often considered as disposable or, you know, um, unorthodox, so to speak. And so the use of muslin is kind of a, a, a clear connection to my mom's history as a seamstress. The role of the pattern mm -hmm. paper is another connection to my mom's history as a seamstress. And the colors in this one in particular, um, using blue wax paper that's used mm -hmm. to transfer the drawing of, you know, the silhouette of an arm, a silhouette of a dress onto fabric. Um, and then gold leaf, is another connection to the history of Andean um, artifacts, um, in particular thinking about the gold that is often represented in, in museums as kind of standalone without context, right? Um, right. And, and so this, this is kind of back and forth of incorporating the hand and the history of my parents into the work while discussing these notions of spaces that are meant for one and not meant for, for one. And then building on top to create one's own identity. And so the, the work here is entitled Los Desaparecidos, which translates to the disappeared, which is um, connection to the, um, the people that were disappeared in Argentina and in Chile during dictatorships. And so I, I'm, constantly wanting to kind of reconnect, not reconnect, but make um, parallels to histories that exist in Latin America. Um, and, you know, some of the, the migration and displacement that comes from those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is hung on, uh, what is that at the top? It's like that one is, that's a piece of brass, I believe it might be steel. Okay. Um, so like, I'm trying to, I was taking it a step further, even like in the way that the work is handled and the work it's, it's um, hung on the wall. Yeah. So the piece yeah. is like, there's a rod going through the textile and directly pressed into the wall. So it's kind of like these, right. these hooks that just go right into the wall. Yeah, as we'll see, there's yeah. a real delicacy to a lot of the work that Ronnie does. And I think that you notice that here, the idea of hanging it and letting it kind of be and flutter because it's, yeah. quite, it's quite thin, the material um, in these works. Here's another work from this series, um, The Arbiter of Time, 2018, yeah. uh, which, you know, it's, uh, the design, is, I think, is just wonderful. Um, this sort Thanks. of explosion of form and all then the cutouts uh, of the dressmaker or the garment makers uh, patterning. Um, you know, if you want to think modern art, you've been thinking about Duchamp, the large glass and works like mm -hmm. that. Um, chocolate grinders and all this Dadaist and early surrealist work. But I'm going to ask you about your mom. Did she work yeah. at home or was she working in a in a, a shop in the city? She used to work in the garment district. She used to she work, work okay. for some so kind we'll of, get, uh, we'll, yeah. I think we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Sorry, with yeah, sure. Street, right? Okay, I was, that's what I was wondering because I was just wondering about your exposure to her practice. You know, did you see her working as seamstress all the at time. home much? All the yeah. time, yeah. So she, yeah, she would, you okay, know, so the, she would take on freelance projects, you know, uh -huh. um, and work at home to like late at night doing, you know, works for other people. And I got to see yeah. it firsthand. And all that material yeah. is what was drawing material, you know? Yeah. So. And I assume you can sew a button. Um, I try, but not as good. <laughs> <laughs> all, my, all my friends are always surprised that I can sew a button. You should be able to sew a button. This is just silly. Yeah. Thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure that experience of seeing her almost in a kind of focused way, or maybe, yeah. I don't know, was it something that she did like while she watched TV or... Uh, just sort of in your general, like after dinner, I, I, I'm interested in that kind of it was, family yeah, experience. 
it was kind of um it was nonstop. It was sometimes it was around TV, sometimes it wasn't. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. it was late hours. It's like this thing has yeah. to get done by tomorrow. So staying up to like right. two, three o'clock in the morning. Um right. but also and this going other, to work. Yeah, this other component of inviting people to your space to try on a dress, you know. And mm -hmm. so like a lot of time I got to see her get things started from from scratch, like using paper and tracing paper to make a pattern. And then making all these dresses, which I always found fascinating because you got to make a dress out of muslin first, right? Before you, because mm -hmm. you don't want to make a mistake on the good fabric. So you make it out of right. muslin and then you deconstruct it and then you cut that out of the nice material. So that was also really interesting to me. I was like, wow, that's a lot of work for this one thing that, you know, nowadays we consider like super like consumable, really passive, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And, and so it's kind of it's a kind of element of labor which you've totally transposed into your own practice. Yeah. And I, I want to make it, you know, kind of clear. And so uh, you know, another big part is kind of having her involved in the process of making. Um, like she helped me establish a lot of the the kind of um formats that I create for these work on muslin, you know, the idea of a pocket mm -hmm. on the top that is seamless, that isn't really seen. Um, you know, there's works that we've done collaboratively and, mm. and so it's been really, it's been really exciting to be working with her, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, there's yeah. one in the show, the one downstairs, uh, my yeah, mother's yeah. hand, right? That's our early it's a collaborative one. piece from 2017. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's go to the next image. So, um, just to go back, sorry, I oh, yeah. keep this image in, in your mind of this sort of, I call it some sort of exploding form, but actually you can think of it also as threads, um, bits of yeah, rope, and I it can, relates to this. Yeah, maybe quickly just going to the the previous piece, yep. uh, just so people can kind of get a sense of the making of it. Um, the kipu being this object that is accounting for something. And so I was establishing this connection between that very um, tangible artifact and not really knowing what it's supposed to represent. And so mm -hmm. I kind of uh, started making this connection between that and my dad's role as an arbiter of time, as a referee. And so this yeah. kind of really yeah. space of being responsible for something that's tangible and intangible simultaneously. So yeah. what you see here are actually 45 um, radio lines of the same length and then other lines coming from it. So yeah. it's representing the 45 minutes of a soccer half. All right. Yeah, right. Before added time. Yeah, that's it. I love that. <laughs> so I didn't even realize that. So and there's a symbology or, or symbolism in so much of the material that you're using in these pieces. Mm -hmm. And then that idea of a kind of um, marking or uh, using time and measurement is something which is inherent in Incan kipus. I don't know if people know about these, but these are these remarkable surviving uh, thread-like forms that were used by the Inca in the Andes to calculate, to calculate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it it's determined by the number of knots, the spacing, um, a really intricate system of mathematics, uh, which, you know, is almost like a kind of code. Yeah. I mean, so many of them are still being decoded to this day, like whatever's been yeah. unearthed is being decoded. Yeah, not totally and translated, right? Right, exactly. I mean, some of them are, you know, accounting for very clear things like um, finances, right, or like the accounting of a market, uh, of a store, right. or the right. uh, accounting of the population. And then there are some yeah. that are theorized to be um, narrative keepers. So some of them uh, potentially hold um, stories within them. But none of this is certain, you know, other than right. the financial ones that there's some history to them. Yeah. So it could yeah. be language keyed to the numerology. It yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Something that, that's been interesting. Like I tried to, um, I studied um, Quechua uh, for a few months. And one thing that I always found interesting about it is this, it's a cumulative language. I don't think that's a proper term, but it was like you basically just keep adding another sound to it to give it tense and to give it. Yeah. Um, context and so i always found that that there's even in the the 
the language itself is kind of this kind of mathematical accumulation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you studied it in in school? What went or no? This is like completely independent. There's this. Um, oh. um, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's like the Indigenous Language Institute. It's a very small uh -huh. but really helpful place. It was in Chelsea, like around 25th Street or something. Right. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And and you learn how to speak it and and read it. Um, I only did one semester, so I didn't get to. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know that I would. Survive. There was a show. Yeah, you were in a group show at the Whitney uh, where yeah. they used Quechua language. Yeah. Uh, I think for the first time, you know, in an art show, so sort of mm -hmm. filtering in. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the exhibition. This sure. is on now, so that gives everybody a kind of background and get a sense of what you're now doing in 2022 as a kind of expansion of your practice and yeah. uh, related to what we were talking about uh, about your mom. Um, the mm -hmm. entryway here features a work here, uh, vert uh, sort of portrait uh, format work on the wall, which you see here. It's called, I, I was instantly intrigued, 37 between 6th and 7th. That's like <laughs> what, you know, what, what you say to a cabbie, 30 yeah. uh, taxi cab, 37 between 6th and 7th from 2022. Yeah. And note the material, pattern paper, mylar, gold leaf, and wax on unstretched uh, muslin and everyone yeah. remember the early work with those fringes and you can mm -hmm. see that that sort of kind of results here although when you think about the title it does also remind me of the skyline um mm. and then this uh, this uh, slicing up of uh the forms in order to sort of make a new papier collé um pasted papers on the muslin um and before we launch into it i just want to show everybody this which is I don't know, 37, 37th <laughs> Street between 6th and 7th Avenues, yeah. Broadway, in this case, Broadway and 7th. But I have to say, you're, you're saying your mom worked in this area, the garment district, yeah. and New Yorkers will know that in terms of Manhattan, this is one of the last preserved neighborhoods that hasn't mm. yet been totally exploded. The fabric is intact, the old restaurants, the churches, it hasn't been, largely because people have not moved there to live there residentially yet. Mm -hmm. But the new development of Pennsylvania Station and Penn, Penn South, I think may change the character of this pretty remarkable neighborhood, uh, which is still buzzing with essentially light industry and, yeah. and the trade, the garment trade. So this is, this is where your mom worked, I take it. And you can see wonderful here, like phantom advertisements oh, nice. on these yeah. old buildings of these uh, dressmakers and companies. Is that you know, an anyone is What? Is that an iron? No, I think that's a dress. I think it's a dress oh, okay. here. To look gotcha. I, I, I didn't have time to go there, but I just grabbed this from Google. Um, nice. But anyone who shies away from the garment district, don't, because we're not going to have it forever. The fabric is intact, exactly. So maybe talk a little bit about this, uh, this work and the remarkable technique. Yeah, the the title is definitely from the directions my mom would give us when whoever <laughs> we forgot how to get to her job. Uh, we used to go there often, you know, if like we had to go pick something up or she needed help bringing some or we were going to go do some um, back to school shopping. She's like, you need to come to mm -hmm. me. We'll meet here. So that's where her uh, one of her jobs was that she was there for like 10 years, I think. So I got to know a lot of the designers and the people that she worked with really well as a teenager. Um, and yeah, I think in a way it's uh, thinking about paying homage to, to that hand and thinking about the, the labor that goes into a lot of these things. So connection to lineage in a very literal way, but also thinking about her as someone who's very much in line to the textiles that make up so much um, Andean visual language and a mm -hmm. abstract visual language, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the way I make these is I put gold leaf behind the pattern paper. So whatever is printed on the pattern paper is still uh, somewhat recognizable. Um, in this instance, I would lay out the whole sheet of pattern paper and then create this version of a kipu in different colors. Then that sliced up and then repositioned to create a mo even more abstract space. And so I think what's happening in the evolution of the work is really um, letting 
kind of the the materiality and the making of the work um, feel a bit more fluid as to what they're intended to represent. I think in the past, I, I was very conscious or wanting to be a little bit more, I guess, um, I don't know if explicit is the right word, but kind of um, intentional with what this thing is supposed to represent, right? And I think what's happening is, um, I feel okay just kind of alluding to a certain feeling or kind of a um, a space of of making or of labor and this kind of mapping that has become much more abstract and wanted right. to explore it a little bit further. Um, again, yeah. this is another yeah. kipu piece. Yeah. You can see that here along this edge, which I've given you a detail of, where it feels like, you know, the, the restrictions of the court have released mm. a bit. And then, I mean, I, I was in Peru a couple of years ago. It reminds me of, you know, architecture. It is architectural. You have yeah. almost like a substrata of uh, ink and architecture. These me I'll, I'll have an image later of these great stone blocks and then the city above. And the other comparison I wanted to make, because I am an artist and I can't help it, is <laughs> that sort of response to the city. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that idea of a... Uh, you, I mean, you were an immigrant when you were very young, but the idea of coming to the city, embracing the city, understanding the city, and then la layering yeah. that with your own culture, which Mondrian did when he moved to New York yeah. in the 40s and made one of the greatest paintings ever at Broadway, Boogie Woogie, which totally gets, you know, that idea of the city in the period. And I, I think you've, you've, you've matched that kind of energy in this work. Yeah, I think the title was a direct connection to that piece. And it was another moment in which the parallel histories of, you know, Mondrian representing modernity, right? And so there's this, I believe it's a Lewis Kamnitzer text. He's talking about this anecdote where so many of the Latin American artists were coming to New York to see this painting and actually being disappointed in a way at how huh. inexact the marks are on the painting. So in a way, huh. I, I just find it fascinating that this kind of um, presentation of a painting that is kind of very kind of uh, exact and very clear cut uh, can also present a sense of kind of disappointment that it's not so exact and a right. sense, uh, and also almost a feeling of like like a release of of um, of anxiety in a way that you know right. the inexactness is part of the making of this piece you know yeah and so yeah yeah I think the uh, expectations are of what these things are is really interesting too. I think that it's kind of inexactness frees it to, you know, it allows yeah. it to take on all kinds of meanings. Um, so it's not so defined in a way. Um, and it's true also, like you say about the Mondrian, if you go up close to this at MoMA, you will see so much going on in this painting. It does, mm -hmm. It's not a poster, you know, it's not a poster at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the big work in the middle of the yeah. show. Um, I'm a little mindful of time. Uh, this is amazing, really okay. interesting. But um, this is uh, El Guarda Mera de los Cosmos from the Abyss mm -hmm. 2022. And it's a large scale sculpture in the center of the gallery. Um, it's made uh, using, well, it just says mixed media, which is never helpful on the, uh, on the list of objects. But there's yeah. copper tubing copper tubing, yeah. and then the kinds of materials you're working with. But I'll show yeah. some more images. Here you see it from the other side. Um, and these two elements, which are draped over uh, yep. what is essentially the crossbar. So anyone mm -hmm. who's ever played football, soccer, these look like two uh, kind of goals set up yeah. that you would use with, with netting to play. Um, small scale because it's indoor. And here's right. a detail of this section on the left. Uh, with these beautiful like like streams, uh, almost like a like a cascade waterfall of this material coming down. And let me just put up the detail, and you can talk a little bit about this yeah. part of it. Yeah, this is um, uh, two sheets of uh, pattern paper fused together, um, mm -hmm. so you're kind of seeing the mapping of two garments at the same time. And then those are cut into strips and reapplied throughout the entirety of the of the muslin, which mm -hmm. if you were to put it flat, I think it's like five, it's five feet by 20 feet. So um, one of the 
things I was interested in is how to represent a painting. How do you represent a work that is, um, I wouldn't say multifunctional, but can be viewed from multiple sides at the same time and still representing the same um, notion of this kind of abstract, ambiguous, fluid space. Um, mm -hmm. So I was really interested in how it would kind of be perceived um, over these these bars. So the the connection to the bars is very much the portal, the portero, the guardameta. Mm -hmm. There's so many synonyms for the goalkeeper um, in Spanish. And so I really like to play on words of what that represents poetically and what it represents to kind of um, protect the portal, um, to be the one um, to be on guard of this goal. Uh, so the, the sculpture is a, um, I'm losing my words here. It's a, it's a modular piece. And so they are made out of the same kind of cane shape component. Mm -hmm. And so this piece can kind of be um, reoriented um, and maneuvered to create another right. an, another kind of design from it. And so, yeah, this kind of um, modular uh, specific unit is coming from this connection to um, Andean architecture huh. and that having is... the checkerboard be a big part of this um, connection to portals, but also um, reimagination of what space can be. So the grid is a big component, uh, both with Andean architecture, but also very clearly thinking about this connection to minimalism and what that represents. So right. um, there's a lot of investigation of like what the, the how the material can be seen and from what angle. Um, mm -hmm. So if you get close to it, this is kind of what you see. You see the remnants of these pieces and then this kind of like outgrowth of it into a very um abstract space like a very like like a curtain of yeah. uh, of a huge chart of movement yeah uh, that's re really interesting and here's the other piece uh, yeah. which is adjunct to it and we have mm -hmm. a question from andrew cronenborg my old buddy um uh that the idea and you and you a second ago used the word painting to talk about these yeah. these works so how do you think about these in terms of the idea of painting and Andrew mentioned Jack Witten who I was going to put an image of here but yeah. uh, I didn't have time but Jack Witten the way that he made his works using material that he sort of essentially cast paint yeah. or had paint dry and then cut it up and then mosaiced it or tesserated and laid it like in the way that you cut up these papers and then kind of reform them but how do you think about these in, with, with respect to painting? I, Jack Witten's a huge influence on me I, I was really I got, I was really lucky to meet him uh, through um, the yeah. Saturday program, which was an after school program at Cooper. Um, and I got to see a studio and um, got magical to see him. Magical place, right? That amazing. Was a magical place. And really, we, I went uh, once. Yeah, really generous with just talking about how he makes things, you know? Yeah. Um, and as I got to study more and more of his work, realizing that there was this kind of intention of, how do you remove the artist hand from the making of it? You know, it's almost like this like second hand production. And I think his, you know, developer series is a very conscious um, effort to make the gesture almost mechanical, right? And so like his interest in photography and even kind of, um, you know, obviously his, his history in the Air Force kind of reading the land topographically, right? Um, was a big inter um, kind of intersection with my own connection to, to architecture and wanting to understand um, large areas in a, in a kind of quick read. And so like mm -hmm. the globe for me has become this, um, this symbol that I'd like to deconstruct more and more. And so what you see here are these various uh, carrots of gold um, representing latitudinal lines and on top of it, or actually beneath it, are the um, wax paper melted onto the surface of the muslin. And so whenever I'm using the wax, it's literally transferred onto the surface with heat uh, from an iron. And then the gold leaf is on top of it. 
So it's a single piece. It's a big, it's essentially a big circle. It's, you fold yeah. it over. I yeah, see. it's a tondo surf, um, go, draped over the the copper framing. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. So there is, I mean, there always is a, a kind of a painterly quality in a sense. I mean, certainly, obviously, you're using materials like wax, right, which is related mm -hmm. to, um, the, you know, the use of that material and caustic dating back exactly. to ancient times in yeah. multiple continents, and also gold, which, you know, was, was employed from ancient cultures on. So it, it is inherent there. But the form, you know, the works, and I, this is what I was talking about before, everybody, in terms of kind of delicacy. You can see it sway a little bit in the gallery as people yeah. as the air sort of which moves. is nice, yeah, it, yeah. As opposed to the the hardness of the copper, right? And the the copper also is a foundational material in so many cultures. Um, something used in Andean cultures and and you know uh, cultures in Europe. So um, overlaying it with this uh, very delicate sort of form, quite moving, um, yeah. and then relating it, you know, to the title from the abyss. You're talking about things planetary, but also very kind of down to earth in a way mm -hmm. with the patterning of the other, just to go back for a second, this other element in this work. Yeah, I think, I think well, the, the connection to the abyss is coming from Edward Glissant's work on the Podex of Relation and thinking mm -hmm. about things coming uh, from a very deep earth, yeah. you know, or uh, coming from, I mean, his, his work is also really instrumental in my thinking and how um, multiple places can create a foundation. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of an abyss um, offering a really wide lens of history um, and how does that manifest itself? You know, so mm -hmm. for me, it, I mean, it goes back to kind of growing up in the Bronx and thinking about how hip hop is, it's like, synthesis of all these different forms at one time. And also thinking right. about merengue being a synthesis of all these different forms. Um, thinking about salsa music and cumbia as well. Like the history of these sounds, um, you know, their geography is so wide, so wide ranging. So yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, let's look at a couple other pieces and then we're gonna move to questions. Right, okay. From the yeah. Show. This is the left side of the main gallery. This one large, uh, really ebullion and, and active piece. A couple small works and a, a work across the way. Uh, this really beautiful use of blue in your uh, in your work. Um, this one uh, you can see here is a little bit larger scale. Um, yeah. Called B side echo. B side echo, and you instantly start thinking about vinyl. Um, yeah, and you just you were just talking music. about hip hop and yeah. music and scratching and everything else. You kind of feel that here, but also what we were talking about before the way that you somehow managed to capture with these they're almost like force lines in cartooning, uh, but a feeling of sound, a feeling of reverberation. Um, yeah, in these in these works, and yeah, the I detail think... of this one just to give you a sense of the, the surfaces. Yeah. The surfaces are are really. Extraordinary, and then I see there's a little hole here, so it feels that's, like you've that's the compass. It. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, the compass, yeah, to help make um, it. These course, lines are etched. Of course, you could hide surface. that, right? You could hide it, but you've yeah. chosen not to, so that you know the process is a little bit in, in there. And then yeah. here, I took this in raking light, so you can see how it's sort of been gouged, you know, yeah. like the grooves of a record. Mm -hmm. like the grooves were back on. anyway i'm just talking but um that, that idea of the planetary is so intense in, in many of these works yeah i think the connection to the music here again um i was thinking about my friend charles edward framber who's a mu musician and sound artist and what's the uh, last name fambro f-a-m-b-r-o okay. and okay. turntablism um and these notions of, of abstraction um uh, being ever present within the work um mm. and the etching into it was really thinking about vinyl thinking about music as this generative generative force um mm. i don't know maybe it's a bit nostalgic i was thinking <laughs> you know um planet rock is not too far removed from some of the the source material of this right. and then it expands into the into outer space and how this blue 
again, the wax transfer is coming from from uh, garment making, you know, and it's right. all just kind of applied iron directly onto the surface. Um, yeah. And so this notion of the blueprint coming into it as well as mm. this Art more architecture. Um, place onto which to um, project your imagination. And so the blue, there, there's a lot of connection to that as well. Hmm. There's a couple more of these, just means you can go through these smaller works um, yeah. that are part of this sort of suite of works. Again, yeah. wax on muslin, some with gold, some with silver, as you'll see, there's a detail. You know, the feeling of fabric is very strong, jeans, denim, um, that kind of thing is very strong here. And then this really beautiful one, um, where you have, you know, a kind of image of a sun uh, mm -hmm. for the title, 2022. Um, and the sun and the moon seem to factor a little bit into your work. I mean, it almost feels like it's parental and planetary. Um, yeah. And also, you know, as the kind of materials which were associated in uh, religious art, Christian art, uh, with gold and silver, sun and moon, which is what, you know, a lot of the materials that you're working with. Yeah, the duality and this, in, in, in the in the work is, uh, you know, maybe a bit on the nose, but that's something that I'm really interested in kind of suggesting duality is potentially limiting in a way, but yeah. also as a starting point for a lot of the discussions about multiplicity and intersectionality. Right. So yeah. they are kind of these two characters that come into play a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so here it's a uh, kind of this gold piece submerging and emerging um, from from the silver. Yeah, it feels like it's static and something new and abraded at the same time. Yeah. And this one, and, uh, go spend time with this one. I love it. I was sitting in front of this thanks. for a while. Um, <laughs> every measure of zero, Global South, reference to the idea of flipping the world um yeah. why do we see north as the top um but also you know an absolutely exquisite use of these materials um in this case wax silver leaf carbon and mylar and mylar and you don't realize it till you get in front of it but here's a picture i took like from below and you could see the way the silver glistens on the mm -hmm. on the surface there's a there's a aerobic quality to in engaging with your art which I think in my mind sort of connects with the way that you kind of lead us through your mother's hands mm -hmm. and your father's feet in moving through these works. <laughs> maybe that's too, maybe that's too on the nose, but I think there's this idea of mo moving, gesture, um, patterning, flitting around. I mean, also I was noticing that so many of the words um, that we use that you that are on the patterns, the McCall's or the Butterick patterns relate yeah. to soccer, like yeah. uh, end and seam and guide and pattern. There are words that we use when we describe football matches. Yeah, and center back continuity also. is strong. Yeah, right. So, yeah, exactly. And there's so many of those. And the uh, seams, you know, we always talk about hitting the seam and with passing and cutting, right? A cut. Yeah, a move. Um, it's all really nicely connected, but that idea of you as a viewer, you're not static. You need to move around these things and to see them and do weird, you know, motions in the gallery to get the light effects, because a lot of the work is definitely about light is also about light. And you see that, you know, no better than here lost <laughs> in one, one of the bigger, uh, bigger works on the wall from 2022, this mm -hmm. extravagant image of instead of the vertical kipu, now they're sort of spreading um, latitudinally. Is that yeah. right? Spreading, spreading wide here across the surface. So yeah, just a I, couple I, more. Here, here's a nice detail of this. Go ahead, talk about it. Go ahead, Ronnie. No, I was just gonna say, I hadn't thought about that. It's a, this kind of connection to the hand and the foot um, and the making of these pieces. But you're, you're right, that sense of movement is something I always wanna keep, um, kind of available. Uh, mm. I, I guess there's just also this component of kind of um, not wanting to work to fall into a space of like representing um, a specific history. Like this, 
this kind of negotiable space that happened in very early on in the work is something mm -hmm. that I really want to relay as something that is just as um, as real and as current, you know, and I think the connection to Glissant is really kind of motivating for me as well, mm -hmm. where the kind of instability um, or the unavailability in his in his case, the opacity of something is is just as political as like, you know, um, kind of um, detailing your your enemy, so to speak. Like these things are important to understand as something that is in constant motion and that, you know, um, it can connect to like even some of the like cyclical aspects of the, the way we um, we kind of produce some imagery or talk about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I don't know if that's really well uh, kind of expressed right now, but hmm. that sense of movement is something that I'm really, I want to make feel um, potentially political. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how else then do you activate it, right? Because I, I get what you're saying, you know, but, and I think you can see how the work at the Queens Museum, which is a museum which I, it, of all the museums in the city is one of the best at connecting with its environment, its neighborhood, mm -hmm. the variety of cultures that we find in Queens. So how do you connect, and that large scale piece, you know, which would draw people in and you could walk on it, wonderful. How do you connect, you know, the practice now, these kinds of works to, you know, ostensibly a larger audience that it feels like you're kind of seeking, you know, and mm. maybe, Maybe that happens in the Delta Terminal, which we'll end with, uh, trust sure. me, Carolyn, in two minutes. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, these works, which I, I think they, they really do speak to, um, you know, a broader audience in a way. Yeah. Um, and it's just a question, I don't know, I'm sort of puzzling over this because the way you talk about it, the political aspect of it, the concepts, yeah. of, uh, ideas of immigration, and you just see in this work here that I'm showing, which is in the show, and details on the right, that movement and flow. And, you know, it reminds me uh, in a very different way, but of Julie Maratou's works with the idea of mm -hmm. people moving around the globe and, um, and emigration and immigration, et cetera. And you get that, that feeling. And then, it, and then when you get up close to it, you see, you know, bodies and that connection with uh, technique and process and all the things you've been talking about with your mom, yeah. et cetera, you know? I, I think that's the challenge in a way. Yeah. I don't know how you, how you consider it. I think that sense of like reimagining something can be just as kind of rebellious potentially or, or like um, counter to mm -hmm. an establishment. So like this piece is named Chixi Kipu and the Chixi comes from this term, um, an indigenous term that the writer Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui talks about in a book. And it's all coming from indigenous culture it's all coming from an understanding that the there is you know there is a self um you know there's this kind of like intended third right so she uses the notion of gray as one way to understand it so gray is black and white and gray simultaneously right and so how do you present that how is this kind of reimagination and in this case like a redefinition of the thing an exploratory decolonial aspect of interpreting space and interpreting politics. You know, yeah. I'm using her terms to kind of relay a little bit of my intentions. Um, and so I think that reimagination can be really liberating, you know, and almost crucial to kind of get a sense of like what a future might look like um, or right. what spaces that are, aren't so fixed on a binary might look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've taken on this challenge in, in a really interesting way, which is both, um, you know, intellectual and obviously aesthetic when we're talking about it in this way. Um, and it also relates to the kind of traditions that, you know, I, I know you're interested in. And mm -hmm. when I went to Peru, yeah. I, it sort of blew my mind, right? You, you, you remove yourself from your north, you know, northern, western perspective, and you're seeing things like this at the museum. In, in Lima, and then the walls at Cusco, which were just like a, a new, a different kind of language than we're used mm -hmm. to thinking about in art. Um, and I think that's one of the laudable elements of your practice that you really are trying to develop a different kind of language um, 
to think about uh, our own realities and you know something like this uh, this was my favorite thing a, a yupana yeah. an architectural model i mean they're, they're conceiving in stone space. yeah in yeah. stone in this block and then you go to the cusco and there it is right there are yeah. the walls and then the spanish tried to mimic it and it was pathetic they couldn't do it they couldn't do it mm -hmm. the cuts that the inca were making so what I, what we see here is like you know the product of uh, over a de uh, of a decade of you it feels like exploring these ideas and developing now this sort of richly original uh language um in these works and in these you know these beautiful paintings constructions papier collet whatever you want to call them um <laughs> and with these like this is just a detail of this remarkable little area here where mm -hmm. somehow the gold has has come back just briefly like a a little burst of sound um in the <laughs> overall symphony and then you see all these arrows and the dressing everything works um yeah uh, in this, bringing it all together. So I hope this makes sense to everybody, these sort of motion lines um, and then the dressmaker elements here. So let me just end with these two and then we can look at Delta, which is Warhol's dance diagram, which is the thing that I thought of when I was in the gallery, the sort of directing of your moves and spaces, which he was taking from, you know, mass cultural uh, dance books that taught you how to do, in this case, the Foxtrot um, mm -hmm. and also, you yeah, know, these incredible <laughs> data-based charts that you can get now of every football player, soccer player through a match, every move they made, every pass they made, et cetera. Lionel Messi here um, beating yeah. Manchester City long ago, 2015, <laughs> number 10, of course, for Argentina and Barcelona and now PSG. Um, and, uh, you know, 90% completion rate on his passes. But these kind of abstract things which really resonate to certain pockets of people and that you brought together um, in these works. So let me just end with this. Uh, everyone, no one likes to spend time in the airports, but right now, LaGuardia Air Airport is a great place to spend time. The American Airlines terminal is full of uh, magnificent works and the new Delta terminal, Delta Airlines terminal, um, which I haven't been to yet, has a massive work by uh, Rani here, um, as you can see. Um, maybe just the last two minutes, uh, talk a bit about this commission. Yeah, it was, um, it's a really nice combination of a lot of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, in a way it kind of, it's a representation of that initial drawing you said from, you showed from 2012. It's like, this is a, a gym floor created from, from scratch, built mm -hmm. together to fall into the space where the floor becomes the wall um and everything's painted on the way you would paint a gym floor the varnishes are considered the way you would consider a gym floor um there's mm -hmm. gold leaf and silver leaf on top so that throughout the day this kind of thing uh this this the object kind of shifts and kind of brilliance so you know there's a notion of time even in the making of the work and mm -hmm. it, it it really is thinking about um Th that abstract space and this reimagination of a city in a way like how is it that i can best represent the migrant communities the uh, soccer communities you know that yeah. i grew up with and paying paying tribute to them so mm -hmm. yeah um i'm really happy with this piece you know uh it how gave tall me an opportunity. is it how's it well, what's the it's height three, it's 45 feet it's three stories tall 45 so it, feet. it runs the 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 height of the whole terminal so yeah. it, it's pretty big. You're working yeah. with uh, you're working with Studio DR Design. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, I worked my project manager. Um, yeah, I had to hire a higher project manager, an architect, an engineer. Yeah. Um, Panic NYC was architect. Um, okay. Yeah, and it, it was it was definitely an undertaking. It was it was uh, <laughs> a year's worth of learning throughout the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, they must have seen the show at Queens and thought this this would be a you know someone great to commission for this piece. How yeah. do you, what what do you, how do you how do you uh, explain the title or what does the title mean to you? It's um, I was trying to convey a space that's um, forever kind of moving and shifting, so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Pacha thinking about land and cosmopolitanism, this kind of obvious 
connection to the city and something that's always moving for you know constantly mm -hmm. shifting a sense of overtime both in playing but also mm -hmm. the people that make the space available um you know this kind of uh invisible labor that makes the city right. available to all of us constantly so right. there's a there's a kind of a layering a layering of meaning through the through the words that i wanted to um, that i used to title the work yeah and then over time kind of a link to sport but also something yeah. in a more general sense temporal um yeah about exactly. transit and transit and moving from place to place all right well that's great amazing thank you so much i will i will step aside thank you uh, thank you so much ronnie for the conversation I, I i love it the work is absorbing um and wonderful to look at i encourage everyone to get to uh, alexander gray at west 26th street uh, before it closes on october 15th october mm -hmm. 15th um and i'm going to turn it back over to carolyn thank you ronnie thanks jason yeah thank you both um so so much a rich really rich conversation um so let's see for questions we first have uh our friend ge um you should be able to unmute ge thank you so much carolyn and, uh, jason and, and ronnie i i'm so pulled in by this work thank you so much um I didn't know about your work before, so I read your press release. And okay. in the press release, um, uh, you talk about how uh, Sylvia Rivera uh, Kus Kusnikansky, I'm, I, 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 I'd read about them before, but I, I'm sorry, I don't understand how to pronounce her name. Um, but anyway, her description of the dialectic uh, that doesn't uh, accumulate in a synthesis, but kind of lives on in permanent movement. And uh, can you talk about yeah. how that drives your practice? Um, well, yeah, I haven't talked about dialectic in a while, but that's something that has come up over the, you know, in, in writing about the work and trying to explain a little bit more this uh, confrontation between um, opposites, right? And so what it means to be within it and in a way how to incorporate both at the same time to establish an, at least for me a space that feels more honoring of the contention between the two and potentially the conflict between the two to be a bit more honest a bit more liberating about this negotiation because i think one thing that i've always um felt uneasy about is especially especially um in representing your work that is biographical establishing identity as this very fixed thing because it's kind of monolithic thing right and so i think what the dialectic offers is separation from from this essentialism right and so the this notion of synthesis almost being a a, a foundation rather than something that we arrive upon. And so this is something that I find really freeing. And I think she talks about it really well, that if we just kind of understand this as a foundation or a basis for um, a new reality um, or a reimagination, it, it'd be um, much more in line with this kind of decolonial mentality um, in every aspect of culture and even government. I hope that it, Oh no, that brings us right along. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, sure. And and brings me in even further. So thank you. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you, um, GE, for that question. Um, and I'm going to turn it to uh, uh, Chloe uh, next for a question. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you so much for your generosity in today's conversation. I have so many questions, but. Um, the one I wanted to ask you has to do with what I've noticed as you've walked through your work, because on the one hand, there's this revelatory process to your work, mapping time, mapping direction, mapping teamless mm -hmm. feet that move through the rules of the game. But on the other hand, there's this observation and this idea of re-seeing, reinterpreting, kind of showing us what we don't see in hardwood floors, in yeah. Escape. And so I wonder if you could speak, you, you've touched on it here and there throughout, as I know it threads through your relationship to architectures, um, mm -hmm. how you feel architectures 
maybe prescribe some of those things and whether you are kind of mm. acting as, you know, critical of pulling out something maybe that we don't usually see or in constant dialogue with that and mm -hmm. kind of pushing that further. I'm curious to hear you speak on that a bit. Yeah, I think it's something, it's just been since early on thinking about space mm -hmm. as this, um, way of actually having to kind of perform within it. Um, and, it, it, you know, sports kind of being a very clear indicator of that. Um, it's interesting, you know, that when Jason was talking about uh, or mentioned Cooper, the space of literature was also a really big influence on me when I was an undergrad. Um, the piece by Blanchot and thinking about this remapping of space, both uh, in an imaginary, but on a physical plane. And then when I came across, or was always, I, I guess, thinking about spaces in which I didn't exist, but I knew were mine, right? So like Andean architecture being a space from which I'm from, but didn't really have access to. So there was always this kind of back and forth of what a portal is supposed to represent. What is a door supposed to represent and not, um, being fixated on the meaning of it within, I guess, the North American culture, right? And so this play of how we're supposed to perform in a space was always in flux for me. And, you know, we can talk about code switching, we can talk about even etiquette sometimes, you know, something as simple of like, this is not about architecture, but like, understanding that giving a hug to a stranger is not normal in the US, but it would be in, you know, in Ecuador, like things like that. Um, I, I think I'm shifting a bit away from your question about architecture. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, the role of architecture, I think is becoming a bit more um, available to me in a very, real experiential place. I think in, I've been fortunate with the projects that have been invited to do where I have access to more physical space. In the past, everything was a schematic. And so now I think what's happening is that there's this kind of like shift between representing the schematic within the physical space so not everything feels um, fixed in a way. I hope that gets to your question a bit. Sorry, I went back and forth. A lot of ideas are clear. Mm -hmm. No, I loved it. Thank you so much. It's really helpful yeah. to hear you speak to that idea of the doorway as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chloe and Rani. Um, thank you um, all so much um, for uh, sticking through our conversation. It's been incredible. Um, we have a tradition at the rail of ending our events with a poetry reading. Um, and I'm really thrilled to welcome poet today, Amish Trivedi. Poet, critic, and educator Amish Trivedi is from Stone Mountain, Georgia. He's the author of Future Panic from Cohen Press, Your Relationship to Motion Has Changed, and Sound Chest. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Delaware. Thank you, Amish, so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and thank you, Carolyn, for this uh, wonderful invitation. And uh, thank you, Ronnie and Jason, for that amazing talk. I uh, totally had the option to step out and was like, no, I actually want to, this was, I was really <laughs> drawn in. So thank you. Um, just a couple of poems to end our day here. Um, thank you again. Um, this one's uh, one of the ones that's in the uh, latest issue of Brooklyn Rail. It's called Wonderful Land. In movies, the hero always smiles before they die. A wide vista opens, spreads out a lover, the road unimagined, I realize. In a requiem of hours, the tempo slows, slightly to create the proper mood, the dirge sense of demise looming like a sleepless night pressure fit into the walls of the canyon by a flooding river. Another world is not hard to see while your sins are thick in veins, or how to choke on your ghosts is the modern approach to a science not yet dead. I drew a heart across the ground where I wanted everything to grow and seeded the field so we might talk of it to it. 
Um, this is another um, poem in uh, the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I don't see Anselm, but uh, he really um, encouraged this one. Uh, it's a, a poem for a friend, uh, Matt Hendrickson, who uh, passed away in March. It's called Green Boots. Along our arms we mark time, mark the hours and seconds as flesh trusses, slow the body, withholds, keeps us together from flooding out into ether. Let's pray there was a bolt of lightning and no moment of sadness or grief or awareness. Along the trail, we know now to tip a cap or ring a bell or holler. Or maybe making everyone laugh disrupts the unrestrained division of cells, our bodies fighting to hold on longer before bursting, pressure equalizing between us and the universe we sieve into. Um, one last poem. Um, it's going to be the title poem uh, of this uh, upcoming manuscript um, that I will be sending out soon. Um, it's called The Depression Era. Or the way the wind sweeps across a desert. I tried to grow a heart for you, it didn't take. Or how the landscape fades when the city grows its way beyond lines drawn, enough to contain all want. An imagined eye spoken to with every breath drawn from a well that keeps me guessing if the way light escapes is a sign that gravity has to decay after holding together a universe. Now I imagine an eye that could say the things it should have stopped being in denial of before, or how the organs that fail indicate rupture, fragmentation, how they appear and reappear in the same frame without anyone misdiagnosing them. A thing unseen is a negation of what is sensed, so draw heart instead and hope no one notices just staying in bed all day. My eyes find some birds that black out the sky just to keep from wondering how far it goes. The atmosphere creates parallax or a way to put things out of order to keep people guessing forever. Yet the skin obscures too. The, the organs which fail are always the ones cut out last when they rot through the center and risk systemic failure. Systems are failing, but no one waits for the doctor to cover the body, so it just gets burned in the nearest our yard or eyelid. Material world or world as material, a point of calcification, a point from which to forgive the sins which aren't recorded anywhere else. Or the river down which the body was never seen again, where the stones that weighed the body down were never swept again until the sea collapsed around them. Or the spasm that throws blindly the clot into the chambers that make them startle and fire, fire out, misfire and misfade, a facade of plausible when the aching becomes a way of biting through the bone to sever an arm that got trapped. Or how memory bends back around, so reach through the legs far enough to catch it before it falls over onto a face, as if to prove the shape of memory is really just denial to everyone who isn't me. What goes hiding, what goes hiding and hidden into the scene of the film in which the cuts of the frames per second that can't be seen because the brain is not the screen onto which the film was ever projected in the first place. The way across, the way through to the final moments in which the object of the world is seen as what it is, the world as whole, not as container of objects, but as object, as the bridge burns or car crashes or sun collapses into the oil fire of sea. In the longer version of the treatment, out of view so that another tension can grow, can escape of the waves in which the rocks are surely smoothed by now, or, the wa or as the wave upon rock, or as negation of wave that is wave, or as acclimatization, or as acclaim, or the way memory seems to rewrite whatever written into too deeply, or just on the surface of a prayer or sermon or magical sung in dreary tone to evoke the terror of being known to every sinner who goes unacknowledged for their sin. 
the world as recalcitrant, that which denies in the face of denial, in the space of understanding of the grace which was left over in the moments the universe sprang forth, swam forth of detail of bridge matter. Thank you. Wow, Amish, thank you so, so much. That incredible reading. Um, thank you, Ronnie and Jason, for such an amazing conversation. Of course, thank you um, to Alexander Gray for helping make today's event possible. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and our amazing archive. Um, so you can view today's full um, event uh, recorded on our YouTube channel and archive. It will be up there shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and our public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And please do join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for the poem Writes Itself, a reading curated by the amazing Ty Cooper featuring Ty, Riley Mack, Noah Mendoza, and Aaron Paris. You can now turn on your uh, microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so, so much again. Thank, thank you, everybody, everyone. for coming. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Amish. Amazing. Amish, thank you very much for that reading. Oh, thank thank you. Thanks, Russian really era. Yeah. We're in it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the reading. Thank you to my, thank thank you to my you parents for you hanging out reading. with us. Thank, thank you, you Ronnie. Ronnie. Thanks, Vaughn. Sorry I missed you guys. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Very I interesting. See Stephen Hannock there, two people from Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Vaughn, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm at the site installing the show. So I, I miss hearing right. everything, but I will again super soon. <laughs> Just try to map Vaughn's movements. Do the you best. Know, that would be impossible. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. Thanks, Vaughn. Had a great time. Yeah, it's been great, great, great oh, day. I'm so oh, happy. Charlie, I'm, Charlie, I'm happy way. rich. <laughs> Congratulations on the show, too. Please go see the show, everyone. Yes. Yeah, Thanks, Paul. Yes, go yes see the congrats. Show. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thanks for the reading, too. Thank great you. Great poems, Amish. Yes. Thank you, GE. That's right, GE. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>